Um, so before I go any further, I want, uh, even though I, I recognize so many faces and I know a lot of you uh, know me and, and had the incredible good fortune to know Henry, um, I want to start off by talking about him and introducing him to those of you who, who had never had the pleasure of meeting him. Um, and when I thought about what I wanted to tell you about Henry, it made me think about this friendly debate that my editor Leslie Wells at Hyperion and I had about how to start this book about Henry and how to introduce him to the reader. And, and she loved this scene that I, that I have in the book where we had just arrived in Minnesota and um, we left our life here where Henry, um, although his blood counts were, were uh, very low and he, and he was quite ill in that way, you couldn't tell. And he was in school and he was the star of his little soccer team and running around and was living a very, very normal life. And we finished school, graduated, had our little soccer graduation party, scooped him up and got in the car with him and, and our son Jack and we drove out to Minneapolis where we entered this incredibly complex and very scary medical world of bone marrow transplantation. And um, we quickly discovered that near that hospital in Minnesota was like the greatest outlet for retail therapy maybe on planet Earth known as Mall of America. <laughs> and uh, so when we would go to the hospital each day and Henry would have to get you know an IV or go through anesthesia or surgical procedure, um, he and Jack were pretty clear that we should get it over with and get out of there and, and go over to the amusement park down the road. And uh, so on the, on the third day we were there, he was getting the third IV um, in a row and his uh, veins were bruised and it was, a, it was a bit of a drag. And he like re looked at this nurse, you know, looking at her thinking like, you better get this IV in on your first shot because you're not getting another chance at this. But he also like, he, he pulls out this sword that my dad had given him right before we left town and he raises it in the air and he looks at her and he said, bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> bring it on. And that's how he lived and, um, and it's, it's, it's really how our whole family has lived. So anyways, that, that was a great way to start a book, right? You know? But I didn't like it enough to start the book that way because Henry wasn't really sick as far as we were concerned. He was, a very, much, he was very much alive and I didn't want people to first meet him in a hospital because that's not where he saw himself and it's certainly not where he, where we, where we saw him either. The list of Henry's favorite things is lengthy and wide ranging. Marbles, watches, and Tom and Jerry cartoons, Batman, Cal Ripken, and a Pokemon named Charizard, Skittles, chocolate croissants, and garlic bread, having a lemonade stand, taking a bath by candlelight, and making phone calls, especially to me. <laughs> um, but at the list of Henry's favorite things, at the top of that list is a little girl who's as beautiful as her name, Bella. Henry met Bella in September 1998 on one of his first days as a member of the Sunflower class at a preschool in Northwest Washington, D.C., just down the street from here. Bella was the teacher's helper, the teacher being her mother. By the time I arrived to pick him up, Henry was in love. At two and three, respectively, Henry and Bella's dates were supervised and there were lots of them. <laughs> Sometimes she came over to our house to play soccer or tag or, or to go to Max's ice cream. Sometimes he went to her house for pizza or swimming or to meet her new hamster. Each October they celebrated their birthdays together. He gave her jewelry, she gave him Batman t-shirts. <laughs> Henry spent a lot of time with Bella, her mom Liani, and her sisters. One warm summer day in June of 2000, Bella invited Henry, then age four, to go swimming at the Inverness Rec Club in her suburban Maryland neighborhood. See you later, alligator, I called out to Henry as my husband, Alan, and I drove away. Wild, wild crocodile, he replied. According to Bella's mom, Henry and the girls swam and played in the pool for a long time. When they were done, Henry jumped out of the pool and took off his wet bathing suit, leaving him naked <laughs> in close proximity to the girls and all the other swimmers and non-swimmers at the pool that afternoon. Mom, Bella whispered intently, Henry's naked. Get him to put his clothes on, or at least a towel. Liani offered up both possibilities, to which Henry replied, it's okay, I'm good. <laughs> when it came time to go back home for lunch, Henry walked with Bella and her family from the pool several blocks to their house, completely naked, without a care in the world. When I asked Henry what he liked most about Bella, he said everything. From this, excuse me, swallow, 
From the sweet smile on her freckled face to her long straight brown hair that was often adorned with flowered colored headbands to her slightly shy and down to earth personality, she was more than just likable. So much so that Henry stopped saying he was gonna marry me. So much so that I didn't even mind. <laughs> the only other girl who ever tempted Henry was Snow White, whom he spent a few days chasing around Walt Disney World. But even she, the fairest of them all, couldn't compete with Bella. Bella was a driving force behind Henry's let's just do it attitude and his unwavering and continuously tested determination to get out of the hospital and get back to living. When Bella called to invite Henry to her ballet recital in June of 2002, nothing was going to stop him from being there. He had just recently graduated from kindergarten. Like many six-year-olds, his portfolio of artwork was filled with white paper colored, covered with colorful magic marker print that read, Henry, 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 Henry. <laughs> his handwriting was beautiful, earning him a P from his teacher for proficient. <laughs> he was great at drawing hearts and flowers, and I have stacks of notes advertising his love for me. My favorite is on a yellow lined post-it that has a picture of us and the words, Henry, I love you, mommy. I will always love you. Later, he made a poster publicizing his love for Bella. It's a beautiful picture of them, two stick figures with huge smiling faces along with three words, all capitalized, Henry, Bella, be love. Henry and Bella were well into the fourth year of their courtship and things were going strong. Henry's bedside table featured a, pic featured a picture of Henry in his number 23 Michael Jordan Chicago Bulls jersey and Bella in a pretty blue dress with little white flowers. They had spent the afternoon playing soccer in our backyard. At this moment in time, Henry is kissing Bella's cheek and she's smiling. Although you can't tell by looking at the picture, they're also holding hands. When Bella sent notes to Henry for his birthday or to plead with him to get well soon, she always signed them, I heart you, Bella, which is all he needed to know. Early one warm, warm and sunny morning, I felt Henry's presence by my bed. When I opened my eyes, there he was, sporting a yellow button-down shirt, blue blazer, and khaki pants. He was dressed and ready to go. Mom, get up, he was whispering. We need to go see Bella. We need to go now, and don't forget what we talked about. The night before, Henry had explained we'd need to leave a little early because he wanted to buy flowers for Bella to give to her after her ballet recital. I looked at the clock, 6.32 a.m. <laughs> Only one of the things I saw was a welcome sight, by the way. We had three hours, 28 minutes. Henry picked out the most beautiful white roses he could find, and we arrived at the auditorium in plenty of time. He joined Bella's mother, sisters, and grandparents to watch her dance. I had left, it was a date after all, but Bella's mom, or little L, as Henry affectionately called her, summed up Henry's expression as mesmerized. I'm not sure if she was describing how he appeared during Bella's performance or afterward when he got to share the same seat with her for the remainder of the recital. On October 25th, 2002, Henry's seventh birthday, he and Jack, his younger brother, were treated to a private performance at our home by a magician named Turtley. Henry's white blood cells had failed him again, necessitating yet another prolonged period of isolation from friends, school, movie theaters, ice cream parlors, amusement parks, just about everything and nearly everyone that made life worth living for him. Turley was able to draw laughter and awe from the boys, but despite being the master of making a triple scoop ice cream cone with Jimmy's from stale milk and ants, Henry knew a birthday party with no friends isn't much of a party at all. Later that evening, he whispered in my ear, Mommy, it's my birthday and I really want to see Bella. He added, don't tell anyone, especially not Dr. Wagner. <laughs> Henry knew I would understand that a date with Bella could more than turn the day around. I asked Alan to take Jack upstairs and get him ready for bed. Within minutes, Henry and I were in the car, destination, Bella's house. I knew that the risks associated with seeing Bella were nothing compared to the rewards. If we snuck in a visit with Bella from time to time, Henry would keep fighting, and one day he would get better. 